Good morning. And welcome to the meeting place of the Friendship Presbyterian Church. I'm glad you're here. My name is Mark Finch, and it's my honor to be your liturgist today. Uh, this is the time for announcements. Are there any announcements? Please join me in the call to worship. Friends, we gather this day, the first Sunday of Lent, to celebrate life. The life we have been given by our Lord. The life we share with one another in community. The life that Jesus gives his us. Let us be grateful for the joy of life. And let us worship our God. We have come together this morning for renewal in worship and as a community of faith. We've greeted one another, laughed, and hugged, but now the time of reflection and stillness is upon us. It is the first Sunday in Lent, the season for journeys of the heart. Close your eyes. Be still. Listen. We are entering a holy time. The Lenten candles have been lit, but over the next six weeks, the light will slowly fade into darkness. For we are retelling the story of Jesus' betrayal and suffering and death. We do this not to be morbid, but because in the story of Jesus' death and resurrection, God is revealed in an amazing transformation of death into life, in endings transformed into beginnings, and in dead ends that become a source for new possibilities. This is the sacred center of our faith, the truth made manifest in Jesus Christ that God is in each and every one of us, quietly transforming us and the world. In his pain and suffering, Jesus speaks to every pain and loss you have endured and offers you the promise of transformation. It's an old story, but it still has the power to reveal, to heal, and to redeem. Jesus is at the heart of our faith in the depth of our souls. He is waiting for us, inviting us to leave ordinary time and follow along with him on the journey that brought him to the cross. Listen in silence, for Jesus is calling you. As we extinguish this light, we acknowledge the darkness and pain of injustice in the world. Let us pray. Loving God, as we journey through this holy season of Lent, give us strength and courage to make the changes that are needed in our lives. Open our hearts and minds to your steadfast presence and help us to put our trust in you. Amen. Please stand if you are able and join me in our opening hymn, Lord, who throughout these 40 days.
In the season of Lent, we are invited to consider how we live as followers of Christ. To look at our decisions and our actions straight on and to hold them up to the example of Christ and to make amends. In this time of silence and our prayers together, let us look at our lives. Please join me in our unison prayer of confession, followed by a time of silent confession. Most merciful God, whose Son, Jesus Christ, was tempted in every way, yet without sin, we confess before you that we have sinned. We have a hunger after that which does not satisfy. We have compromised with evil. We have added to your power to protect us. Forgive our lack of faith. Have mercy on our weakness. Restore in us such love and trust that we may walk in your ways and delight in doing your will. Amen. Friends, hear this good news. The love of God is beyond measure, and you are included in that love. Know that you are forgiven and thus free to love and serve. Amen. Please stand for the singing of the Lord.
Let's pray. Gracious Father, as we come this first Sunday in Lent, we have so much on our minds. Looking ahead as we think about all the, the stories from Scripture, the true stories, and the suffering, the temptation, the pain, all that our Savior had to go through should break our hearts. It should break our hearts when we think of the sacrifice made for each and every one of us. 
Heavenly Father, help us to be your grateful people. Help us to serve you in a special way during this time. Whatever we're being called, wherever we're being called to serve, whatever we're called to do, that it, especially this time of this, the Lent season, that we remember you and remember that we're called, not called to sit on our couch, but called to do something, to further your kingdom. Touch us, move us, motivate us to do those things this day. And Heavenly Father, when we come to this place, we lift our joys. We look at the beautiful weather and we say thank you. But we also have concerns this day. We think of the people in Ukraine. What they're going through. That, and I don't think anyone here can imagine it. Unless you've been to war. So maybe some can, but... The rest of us just can't imagine what their lives are like today as compared to two weeks ago. Heavenly Father, we pray for those people. We pray for the president. Continue to give him strength. We also pray for the Russian people that you would soften their hearts, that you would change their evil desires into your desires. Father, you have the power to do those things, and we hand those things over to you this day. We also pray for traveling mercies for Mark and Charlie, and be with them. May they have a wonderful time being with family, but protect them. We also think of Nancy Rogers this day, who's been in a great deal of pain. Heavenly Father, help her endure that pain. May the pain lessen. We also think of Frank and Donna, who are a little bit under the weather today. May they be back worshiping with us soon. We think of those people, those other people that aren't here this day. Um, may you bless them and may they return soon. We remember Gary, who was supposed to have surgery and now he has some other things going on. And Heavenly Father, give his doctors wisdom and encourage Gary that he keeps his spirits up so that he can get through all that, all that he has to endure in, in the coming days. We also have the joy of Lily being here and Michelle representing the Girl Scouts. And so we just thank you that we have people that uh, have high morals. And, and so we're grateful for that as well as when we think of the, the Boy Scouts and, and the things that they teach our children. So we, we praise you for that. And Father, we come here worshiping and praising you, we wouldn't be here without Jesus, without all that he did for us, all the sacrifices, the stories that he told, the parables, the miracles that he performed, the healings, how he loved other people, the multiplying of the bread and the fish. He's done so much. And as we come into the season where we retell those stories, those wonderful, wonderful stories, we know that Palm Sunday comes, but then after Palm Sunday, Good Friday, and what he had to endure for us. And so we bring honor and praises to him, knowing that he died for our sins. Help us to remember that during this worship as we recite the prayer that he said to you so long ago. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. It's the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. At this time, our hymn of preparation, the scout hymn. So if you are able, please stand.
blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above, ye heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen. Father, I just want to say thank you. Thank you for all that you've done for us, all that you've given us. And so as we give back just a small portion, may the kingdom grow because of what we've given this day. In the name of your son, amen. Okay, come on up, kids. How are we doing today? Good. I am in such a good mood today, I brought you something, and I'm going to give it to you. <laughs> Let me see here. Now, you can go ahead and eat it, but not until I give you the rules, okay? <laughs> now, you can go ahead and eat that, and it'll taste good, right? Or, if you hold that all through service, and you give it back to me at the end of worship, you can exchange it. <laughs> this. It's up to you. So if you want to go ahead and eat it, go ahead. So, you know the rules, so if you decide to eat, just go ahead. Otherwise, at the end of worship, we'll, we'll exchange those. And that's to remind us, Jesus was tempted in the desert. Satan came and tempted him. Because he'll be tempting, sitting there looking at that boy, and you, you know, if I go on and on and on, you're going to get hungry. <laughs> but Jesus was tempted. He hadn't eaten. And the devil came and said, hey, you're the son of God. Go ahead and make some bread. And he didn't do it, did he? He resisted temptation. But he had gone 40 days without eating. Have you ever gone that long without eating? <laughs> So he was really, really hungry, I'm sure. And then Satan said, if you, if I'll give you all this. I'll just give you all this kingdom, everything that you see. And Jesus is thinking, well, I have the kingdom of God, which is far greater. So he didn't fall for that temptation either, did he? So we're tempted in life. But we know what Jesus knows. If we don't fall into temptation when the devil tries to tempt us, guess what? We're going to get far greater. We're going to have much more than what the devil could ever give us. Can you remember that? Don't fall to the devil's temptation. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, keep us strong today so that when we're tempted, we can say to Satan, it's written in the Bible, and quote your word so that we don't fall into the trap of temptation. And then we settle for a little peanut butter cup and we can have a big mm -hmm. bar. Keep us, help us to remember that. Amen. Thank you for coming up. scripture for the message today comes from Luke chapter 3 verses 21 and 22 and chapter 4 verses 1 through 13. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, you have a message for us, a call to action. Open our minds, our hearts, that we receive all that you have for us and that we act upon what you tell us to do, that we have the courage to resist temptation and hear only your words. Amen. Luke chapter, beginning with chapter 3, verse 21, listen for the words of the Lord. This is a baptism of Jesus. When all the people were being baptized, Jesus was baptized too. He 
As, and as he was praying, heaven was opened, and the Holy Spirit descended upon him in bodily form like a dove. And a voice came from heaven. Right, but it's the voice of God. You are my son, whom I love. With you, I am well pleased. And then over to chapter 4, beginning with verse 1, Jesus is tested in the wilderness. Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, left the Jordan and was led by the Spirit into the wilderness, where for 40 days he was tempted by the devil. He ate nothing during those 40 days, and at the end of them, he was hungry. The devil said to him, If you are the Son of God, tell the stone to become bread. Jesus answered, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone. The devil led him up on, to a high place and showed him in an instant all the kingdoms of the world. And he said to him, I will give you all their authority and splendor. It has been given to me, and I can give it to anyone I want to. If you worship me, it will all be yours. Jesus answered, It is written. Worship the Lord your God and serve him only. The devil led him to Jerusalem and had him stand on the highest point of the temple. If you are the Son of God, he said, throw yourself down from here. For it is written, he will command his angels concerning you to guard you carefully. They will lift you up in their hands so that you will not strike your foot against the stone. Jesus answered, It is said, Do not put the Lord your God to the test. When the devil had finished all this tempting, he left him until an opportune time. This is God's holy word. Now Jesus is about to begin his ministry on earth, his public ministry. But before he could preach, before he can teach, before he can heal, before he can turn water into wine, there's a couple things that he needs to do. First, he must be ordained for ministry, and this was done by his baptism. And then, he must be tempted. He must be tempted by Satan. And I don't think it's an accident that we read this story today as we think ahead about what's to come and all the temptations that we have in our lives. It's no accident that we begin this Lenten season with this scripture. You see, the two tasks that he had, if he succeeded at them, then he would be ready to begin his ministry. And in verses 1 and 2 of chapter 4, he said, Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, left the Jordan and was led by the Spirit into the wilderness, where for 40 days he was tempted by the devil. He ate nothing during those days, and at the end of them he was hungry. If Jesus was to become the second Adam, he had to succeed where the first Adam had failed. Let's take a look at the contrast between the first and second Adam. You see, the first Adam, he was in a beautiful garden. And he could eat from whatever trees he wanted except one. Jesus was in the barren wilderness. The first Adam could eat freely from that garden. Jesus was on a 40-day fast. The first Adam had a companion to help him be strong, or so we thought, right? So he thought. Jesus was alone. However, the Spirit was empowering him. And fourth, where Adam had failed, Jesus was about to succeed. Now there was a young boy, and he was standing by a fruit stand, and the apples were great. They, they were this big, they were shiny, they were red, and he just knew they were juicy and tasty. And he was kind of rubbing his hands over the apple, when the man who ran the fruit stand said to him, boy, are you trying to steal an apple from me? And he said, no, I'm trying not to. <laughs> you see, temptation 
is all around us. And it was no different for our Lord. But Jesus was about to teach us something, wasn't he? In verses 3 and 4, he said, The devil said to him, if, if you are the Son of God, tell the stone to become bread. Jesus answered, It is written, man shall not live by bread alone. Jesus teaches us that there is something more important than our physical needs. The spiritual food, our spiritual needs. Did you get that? There's something more important than our physical needs. There's something more important than our immediate comfort. There's something, something more important than our happiness. And that is obedience to the word of God. Satan says to him, if, lots of the, have a little bit of that doubt in there, doesn't he? <laughs> if you are the son of God, tell the stone to become bread. Isn't it interesting that the last words that Jesus heard before he was thrown into the desert were the words of his father who said, this is my son. Saying to everybody, Jesus was his son. This is my son. And he was proud of his son. And then in verse 22, he says, uh, chapter 3, 22, I believe, Yes. The Holy Spirit descended upon him in bodily form like a dove, and a voice came from heaven, You are my Son, whom I love. With you I am well pleased. And then Satan had the audacity to say, If you are the Son of God. This was an assault on Jesus' trust in the Word of God in his faith in, that, in the word of God. You can almost hear Satan. Are you sure you're really God's son? If you are God's son, why are you hungry? Why are you alone in this desert? Is this how God treats his only son? Surely you're not God's son. And how did Jesus answer? It is written. You see, Jesus turned to the word of God. Jesus was able to resist falling into temptation by standing on the word of God. Jesus teaches us that there is something more important than our physical needs. It's spiritual food. It's obedience to his word, God's holy word. And in verses 5 and 6, it says, The devil led him up to a high place, and showed him in an instant all the kingdoms of the world. And he said to him, I will give you all their authority and splendor. It has been given me, and I can give it to anyone I want to. Jesus teaches us that there's something more important than our immediate gratification. It's our eternal destiny. Satan, again, was tempting Jesus. You can almost hear him say, you are the son of God. Why should you have to suffer to become king? I can give it all to you right now. And you won't even have to suffer. I'm sure Jesus didn't want to suffer. And Luke, it says, Father, if you are willing, take this cup from me. But even then, Jesus was willing to do what he came to do. When he said, yet not my will, but your will be done. So the question today, is God asking you to do something you don't want to do? Is he asking you to do something you don't want to do? Something that might make you uncomfortable? Something like witnessing to an unbeliever? He's calling you to do something you, you're sure you can't afford to do, something like give more to, to this ministry or to the greater world Samaritan's purse somewhere else. <coughs> Is he calling you to do more than what you've been doing, to give more of yourself? Is he calling you for, to, to forgive someone that has done the unforgivable to you or to someone you love? 
Whatever God is asking of you this day, you can do it with God's power, with God's obedience when you are obedient to him. How did Jesus resist the temptation of Satan? Both times he said it is written. Both times he turned to the word of God. That's why it's important to have God's word in our heart and in our heads. You see, Jesus was saying, the Bible says. The Bible says. Now, I know someone who says they don't believe a thing in the Bible, so when I say the Bible says, it doesn't make a difference. But that's where I go to anyway, because I believe what the Bible says. Jesus was able to resist Satan with the word of God. And we can resist all our temptations. We're empowered by the Spirit. And if we know his word, we can resist those temptations. Now, there was a poor country preacher, and his wife had been shopping, and she came home with a $250 dress. He was appalled. He said, you paid $250 for this dress. How could you do that? What were you thinking? She said, well, I saw it hanging there. It was like a... a, a a bug in my ear, it must have been Satan, said, boy, that's pretty. That's really pretty. And so I took it, and, and I said, go ahead, try it on, try it on. So I tried it on, and he said, it looks great on you. And I, and I looked, and it did. It looked so nice on me. And the preacher said, and you know what you should have done. You should have said, Satan, get behind me. She said, I did, and he said, it looked good from there, too. <laughs> <laughs> Let's look at verses 9 through 11. The devil led him to Jerusalem, Jerusalem and had him stand on the highest point of the temple. If you are the Son of God, he said, throw yourself down from here, for it is written. Ha, ah, now Satan's talk, quoting scripture, isn't he? He will command his angels concerning you to guard you carefully. They will lift you up in their hands so that you will not strike your head strike your foot against a stone. Jesus teaches us that there's something more important than our physical need. It's spiritual food. It's God's word. Something more important than our immediate gratification is our eternal destiny. And there's something more important than testing God. It's trusting God. Fight Finally, Satan decided to fight fire with fire. You see, he quoted scripture because he knew scripture too, didn't he? The problem was that he didn't finish it, did he? Satan picked out a piece of scripture that he wanted to use, but he failed to take scripture in its entirety. He failed to take all of God's word. He just picked to pick and choose what he wanted. Satan only gave part of the scripture. Don't we do the same thing? We pick out the parts we like and make it fit and justify what we want to do. Yes, we tend to do the same thing. You see, we like the part about the crown that we'll someday receive. But we don't like hearing about the cross that we must bear. We like the part about re being resurrected. But we're not more crazy about the part about dying. We like the part about living forever, but we're not ready just yet to go to heaven, maybe someday, but not today. We like the part about the riches of God, but we don't want to talk about or hear about the sacrifice that we're called to make right now. We like the part about being forgiven, but then we don't want to forgive other people. We like the part about being children of God, but we don't like to hear that we're humble servants. Folks, we can't pick and choose. We have to take all of scripture, every part of it, every bit of it, not just the parts we like, because that's what Satan did in the wilderness. But Jesus didn't let it go unanswered, did he? In verse 12, Jesus answers it. It is said, do not put the Lord your God to the test. We're to trust God without jumping off the temple. 
That's the testing. We're to trust God to keep his word. That's what Jesus did. Jesus trusted his father. You might be thinking, Diane, I'm not Jesus. I'm not as strong as he was. You can be. It is written, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. You see, we take our weakness and we rely on his power, not on our weakness. Or you might be lonely this day. It is written, as I was with Moses, so I will be with you. I will never leave you or forsake you. Maybe you feel unloved. It is written, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Maybe you, or maybe a loved one is sick, and you've prayed and prayed and prayed for healing, and it hasn't come. It is written, my grace is sufficient for you. The answers you seek this day, they're here. Every one of them, the answer is in here. All we have to do is learn his word, rely on his word, memorize his word. We have the privilege of having God's hand, God's word in our hands. And I think most of us probably have more than one Bible at home that we can put in our hands. It is written. The Bible says, Jesus teaches us that we have all we need to be obedient. We have all we need to resist temptation. We have all we need to do the right thing. We have the power of God's Holy Spirit within us. We have the power of prayer. And we have God's Holy Word. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, forgive us when we're weak and say, I just can't do this. I'm just too weak. It is written. And you have empowered us with the Spirit. You've enabled us to do whatever you call us to do. Forgive us when we say, I just, I can do this, but I don't think I can do that. Father, we are children. Help us to be obedient. Help us to be strong. Give us the courage because we have all we need. We have all we need to endure the suffering, to endure the hardship, that we might gain the riches of heaven. We praise you this day. Amen. This time I would ask the elders to come forward and then cover the elements. Friends, this is a joyful feast of the people of God. Men will come from east and west and from north and south and sit at the table in the kingdom of God. This is the Lord's table. Our Savior invites those who trust him to share the feast which he has prepared. According to Luke, when our risen Lord was at the table with his disciples, he took the bread and blessed and broke it and gave it to them, and their eyes were opened and they recognized him. Isn't that our goal, to recognize Jesus in this world and into the next? I mean, he comes to us in so many various, various ways and forms. We want to recognize Jesus. So we remember that on the night of his arrest, he took bread, and after giving thanks to God, he broke it. I should use this, right? <laughs> <laughs> he broke it. He said, this is my body given for you. Take and eat. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup. He said, this cup is a sign of the new covenant sealed in my blood, shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. For as often as you eat of this bread and drink of this cup, you proclaim the saving death of our risen Lord until he comes again. 
And here's a wonderful part. These are the gifts of God for you, the people of God. My oldest son Sam was baptized on the other side of the state. It was in, it was in a Presbyterian church. But when they passed the bread and the cup around, when you were handed the bread, you ate it. And when you were given the cup, that's no way to share a meal. Let's share this meal together, the bread of life. blood of Christ, the cup of salvation. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing, so that you may abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Let us pray. Eternal God, you have graciously accepted us as living members of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. And you have fed us with spiritual food in the sacrament of his body and blood. Send us now into the world in peace. Grant us strength and courage to love and serve you with gladness. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Would the elders please cover the elements? Closing him, if you are able, please stand. Now let us from this table rise. Thank you. 
obedience to God. That's what we need to remember, to be obedient. Now this past week, when he learned what disobedience gets you. <laughs> it wasn't at my house, it was the other grandmother's house. She said, I don't have to listen to you. <laughs> now I know the other grandmother is sterner than I am. <laughs> So she found out what disobedience meant. Then she had to face her father, found out what disobedience meant. And then she had to face her mother, which is tougher than her father. And she found out what disobedience means. So be obedient to God. You don't want to find out what disobedience means. Be obedient. And all God's children say, Amen. Amen.